perfect. So guys, I have the absolute pleasure of introducing our guest speaker this afternoon, somebody who I've been working with in the past. Okay, so I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Charlie Kerrigan to you now for our workshop this afternoon. Dr. Kerrigan is a research fellow at, in classics at Trinity College Dublin. And he teaches their Latin to both undergraduate and postgraduate students. So we're delighted to have an expert now with us this afternoon. His research interests include the reception of Virgil and also Latin ped ped pedagogy. Most notably, and a huge congratulations to Dr. Kerrigan on this, his book, Virgil's Map, was published by Bloomsbury in 2020. So for those of you who are interested, you should give that a Google later. We're delighted here at Belfast Classics to have Dr. Kerrigan with us. So without further delay, what I'll do is I'll pass you over to our speaker as he introduces us to the interesting world of medieval Latin. So thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Kerry, and thank you to Helen as well. Um, it's very nice to be here. You're very welcome, and I'm uh, excited to be with you. Uh, if we were a smaller group, I'd maybe ask us to introduce ourselves individually, but very happily, uh, we're a big group. So um, just take it as read that I welcome you all uh, to the talk. Um, we're recording, as you know, so bear that in mind. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, which is a PowerPoint, and then I will give you a bit of explanation as to how the session will run. I'm hoping to go maybe a bit over the hour, maybe towards half five, um, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, we'll see how we go. And if you need to leave, of course, uh, you can feel free to do so. Okay. Uh, so. So uh, we're going to talk about medieval Latin. Um, can I just get a few nods maybe that you can all hear me and, and see me okay? Great. Okay. And uh, I will be keeping an eye on letting in people. So just uh, be aware of that as well. Uh, so what is medieval Latin? Here's a big question. Uh, I, am, I have some expertise, but I'm by no means, this is by no means the last word on medieval Latin. This is just an introduction uh, for you all. So. What I have in mind for today is I'm going to speak to you for a bit and then I'm going to uh, take some questions. We might have a little bit of a practical session, uh, which I'll explain uh, later in the session, but for the moment it'll be me talking. I have some handouts for you, which again I will share with you at the correct time. And if you want these slides um, afterwards, I'm very happy to forward them to Kerry or, or Helen or to get them to you in some way. Okay, so if that's helpful, um, I'm very happy to do that. Um, we're recording now, as you know, I'll stop the recording for the, the Q&A, if that's okay. Um, just so, you know, we don't have any kind of, um, that's just better, better practice to, to stop recording for that unscripted session, as it were. Uh, but this is being recorded. Um, just to get you thinking about what medieval Latin is, here's a woodcut um, engraving by Albert Doher, the German uh, artist, St. Jerome and his study. Okay, so St. Jerome, uh, fluent in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, uh, translator and reviser of the Old Latin Gospels, and indeed the Latin Bible. Um, and this image nicely brings up a couple of the things that come to mind when you talk of medieval Latin. So we have uh, intense scholarship. We have a Christian context. Uh, we have a uh, man, okay, so to what extent is our archive of medieval Latin a male archive? It's not entirely, um, but these are just the broad themes I want you to think about. To what extent is our archive of medieval Latin a religious archive? And to what extent um, is this, this kind of Latin, this kind of intellectual literary Latin um, of importance? Okay, so you're very welcome. And here we go. Uh, let's begin by, let's begin very broadly and talk about types of Latin. What types of Latin might there be? Well, we're starting from scratch. First type of Latin, of course, is the spoken language. Uh, I want you to remember that. It's one of the things I like to stress to people is that Latin was a spoken language. But because of how history works, we have no evidence we have no audio recordings, as it were, of native speakers speaking Latin. 
Okay, that Latin has survived and it's now the Romance languages. Okay, so our bedrock foundation is this spoken language, which um, was spoken for many centuries in different parts of Europe that we can glimpse, but we don't really have much access to in its ancient form. Um, which leads me to the first distinction, which is between spoken Latin and written Latin. So it's, it might be too obvious to be obvious, but remember that every time we talk about Latin, we're talking about written language, okay? Which is something actually quite different from spoken language. So written language is a representation of speech um, with varying degrees of accuracy. So for instance, even the English text that you might write doesn't really necessarily correspond to how you say the words. Same goes for Latin, okay? Written Latin is what Latin is, in, sorry, in terms of the archive we have, very diverse, as you know, okay? So loads and loads and loads of different kinds of texts. Um, but you might say that mainly the texts that have survived or the texts that have been championed or uh, very famous are texts that are in some way literary or intellectual. So for instance, there's Latin surviving on uh, the walls of Pompeii and on wax tablets, not wax tablets, but wooden tablets from Vindolanda in the north of England. But the Latin everyone talks about and has talked about for centuries is the Latin of Cicero um, and Virgil and maybe St. Augustine uh, and Jerome and people like that. Um, I'm going to use with some reservation or not some reservation, but some uh, warning the term ordinary Latin, um, which is a, a phrase I like very much. Um, sometimes you hear vulgar Latin in older literature. Um, what do I mean by ordinary Latin? Uh, I mean that there was a, a spoken language, everyday language, that sometimes gets represented in literature. Okay, that's a simplification. Um, but in, for instance, certain Roman texts, uh, certain graffiti, certain inscriptions, um, you do get a sense of the everyday language. And in a, a text like Petronius, his uh, Trimachio's dinner party, um, sometimes you get attempts to represent that language in literature. It's not so much a case that there were all the ordinary people speaking one language and all the rich Romans speaking another language. It's just that everyday language is um, not the same thing as recorded uh, language that's recorded in, in literature. Uh, bear with me and I'll give you three more types of Latin. Uh, submerged Latin is something that scholars talk about, uh, which is this very interesting idea that um, sometimes Latin words appear in very early authors, like the comedian Plautus. They're nowhere to be seen in the so-called classical period, in Cicero and Virgil and Livy, but then they reappear in Romance, in French and Spanish and Portuguese and all these languages. So just to give you one example, the verb ascoltare, um, to listen or to hear. It's in the comedies of Plautus. It's not found in classical Latin, but it comes into Italian as ascoltare. What does that mean? Well, too big a topic for me to pick apart here. Um, but you have this idea that there is again, you can see my interest, there is a current of ordinary Latin flowing beneath uh, the literature and reappearing in the Romance languages. Getting on to more familiar territory, I've just been using the phrase classical Latin. What do I mean by that? I mean the literary language of late Republican and early Imperial Rome. So that's a period, say, from 80 BC to, say, 120 CE or AD. Um, that's a language that is written by Roman intellectuals, poets, artists. It's intensely sophisticated. It's modeled very clearly on Greek uh, literature and its models. Um, very self-aware, it's very grand, it's very famous, uh, it's very beautiful at times. And more importantly for what we're talking about today, it's the model. Okay, so what, what even today when most people talk about Latin, what they mean is this kind of Latin. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is that when people are writing throughout what we call the medieval period, often they too are harking back or trying to write like or imitating what they think to be a classical style. And the classical model par excellence has always been Marcus Tullius Cicero, who I'm sure you're aware of, uh, orator and po politician, statesman. He died in the year 43 uh, BC. 
And then last but not least, uh, what do we have? Uh, but we have medieval Latin. Um, one of the things I want to get across to you in this lecture is that uh, there's no such thing as medieval Latin, or to be a bit less uh, controversial about it, me medieval Latin is far too broad a thing to work in any real way. Okay, so um, there, are, there are so many different kinds of Latin text and to group everything from a thousand years between 350 and 1450, say, uh, into this one bracket of medieval Latin is, is too simplistic. It's fine to use it as a kind of catch-all term, but we want to try and be a bit precise, more precise. I'm going to talk about one particular argument uh, by a scholar called Roger Wright, which would see medieval Latin as the creation of the uh, Carolingian period. That's the court of Charlemagne uh, at the beginning of the ninth century in what is now France. Okay, so uh, these are our types of Latin. Uh, let me give you just a couple of points of what I might call theory. One of the major things you to reckon with with medieval Latin is the Christian influence, which is again something that may be too obvious to be obvious. Most of the texts in the Christian, in the Latin archive are Christian from the medieval period. And this encompasses vocabulary, themes, and at a more basic level, worldview, a particular worldview that isn't present in the classical, uh, what you might call pagan period to use a old word. So for instance, old words take on new meanings. Episcopus, borrowed from Greek, it can mean something like an overseer. And then of course it becomes the word for bishop. Caro is the word for flesh, um, not a word you find very often in, in so-called classical Latin, but flesh of course takes on all sorts of meanings in Christian context, as does the idea of sin, which is an invention of beyond my pay grade here, but perhaps you could say it's an invention of, of Christian uh, thinking. Macari in Latin is a verb that means to make a mistake, to mess up. And then what's the difference between that translation and the translation uh, sin? The Latin Bible is a major influence. What do I mean here? I mean, the Latin Bible was translated into Latin. The, the Bible, as I'm sure you know, exists originally in Hebrew and Greek. It's translated into Latin. It exists in what are called old Latin forms until it is retranslated and standardized by Jerome around 400 uh, AD into what is called the Vulgate Bible. And that is the Bible in, in the Christian world for the next thousand years. Um, but that brings its own issues. It's a very complicated text in itself. It's full of Hebrewisms and Greekisms, if you want to call them that. It's a translation text. So um, it's not exactly it's, it's a very stylized piece of work in itself. It's not some kind of natural, uh, naturalistic Latin. Uh, what's my second point of theory for you? Well, it's what I mentioned on the last slide, is that many writers of medieval Latin are deliberately writing or trying to write in a classicizing style. And in fact, this is something that goes through the whole history of Latin, not just in the medieval period. Uh, they are imitating the classical Latin of ancient Rome and in particular that of Cicero. So on the one hand, you have stylistic innovation. So for instance, St. Augustine is someone who is, who is very well versed in what you might call Ciceronian Latin, but he's also an innovator. He writes in a way that is very original and new and he himself becomes a model for later writers. Christian hymns, okay, with simple rhyming lines, uh, these are things you wouldn't see, obviously, in a pre-Christian context. So there's, there's levels of innovation. But in general, and here's something I'd like you to uh, remember, it's not so much a question of when someone is writing as how they are writing. Okay, so it doesn't matter so much whether someone is writing in 200 AD or 1200 AD. It often matters more how they're trying to write. You can have people writing in the 14th century just like Cicero, or the 15th century, just like Cicero, okay? So just trying to get you thinking about how this medieval Latin is uh, a term that's actually um, full of holes, the holes that are useful for us to, to think with. So my final point of theory is that there is no neat chronological journey from early to classical to late to medieval Latin, or no such journey fits with the available evidence. Okay, so these are very convenient labels. Um, but 
things are more complex. Words which appear in Plautus, early second century BC, reappear in the Bible, and they even reappear in the Romance languages, as does, for instance, the accusative and confinitive construction. So you might think that um, the accusative and confinitive, sorry, the accusative and infinitive construction um, is something that's typical of classical Latin and that gets jettisoned in medieval Latin. Well, that's, that's not true. That's what I thought until I researched it further. Okay, um, so very interesting how things are more complex than they appear and you have all these different things that medieval Latin can mean. So those are three points of what you might call theory that I want you to bear in mind. The Christian influence, the classicizing style, and the uh, issue of chronology. Um, if you do have questions, of course, I'd ask you to keep them to the end and you're very welcome to ask me anything at that point. Okay, so a feature that looks late or medieval, quote unquote, may not actually be late or medieval at all. Here, as I've alluded to, is uh, one example idea of what medieval Latin might be, which I've come across relatively recently, and which I find very interesting. Um, if I could just ask you if you are unmuted to mute yourself, um, which will help, on our, uh, help with our audio. Uh, so just try and kind of do some imagining for me here. Um, at one point, uh, people of Latin speaking Europe spoke Latin, okay? And they, some of those people also wrote in Latin. And the gap between what those people were saying and how it was represented in writing was relatively small. It wasn't perfect because you and I don't write as we speak. Okay, so I hope this is clear what I'm saying. Um, say, take the year 250 AD. Okay, the gap between how people were speaking Latin and how spoken Latin was represented in language was relatively small. Then what does, what does everyday language do? It changes all the time. Language is constantly changing. So what you have then is a literary language, the language of the priests and the bureaucrats and the officials, which becomes increasingly divergent from what the people at the crossroads are, are speaking like. And there's a term used in linguistics called diglossia or diglossia, which is this idea that there was an educated elite who were able to write and speak in Latin, the Latin that is proper Latin, quote unquote, with all the I's dotted and the T's crossed and the endings correct and the genders of the words right, etc. But in their daily lives were speaking something that was well, that was becoming French or becoming Italian or becoming Spanish, right? And then for Roger Wright, and I'm inclined to agree with him, although, or sorry, I suppose I'm inclined to be convinced by him. I don't have enough expertise to uh, be that blasé about it. Um, but his argument, and I'll, I'll give you references to all these, these things. Um, he thinks that the decisive moment is this Carolingian Renaissance, this around the years 800 AD, when Charlemagne uh, is the, what is he? He's the emperor of the Franks. He is crowned in Rome as Roman emperor. Um, some of you are, are, are very likely much more expert in this period of history than I am. But anyway, he has a court around him and what they decide to do, led by a, a scholar from England called Alcuin is, they decide to enforce or return to classical models of orthography, which is writing and pronunciation in their official bureaucratic and religious language, okay? So the history of Latin is always marked by these moments of conservatism where people want to try and write like what happened before them. That's what the classics are in a, in a certain sense. And again, I'm giving you a very simplistic summary of what is obviously a very complex phenomenon, but you have this break where Latin goes one way and becomes medieval Latin. It becomes a dead language, if I can use that, that term. It becomes a language of uh, literature, philosophy, etc. But then the spoken language goes its own way, or has been going its own way, and keeps going its own way. You see what I mean? So on a kind of an upper track, you have this language that is now going to be a language of intellectualism. And on the bottom track, you have this language that is going to become the Romance languages. And our first texts in early French, Italian, and Spanish, etc., are our first glimpses of those new writing systems taking effect. 
So I was um, very struck by this argument, partly because what most people take Latin to be, and what I took Latin to be, certainly when I was learning for the first time, is this Latin. It's this Latin that is an educated uh, script rather than a spoken language. Um, so I just find this uh, very interesting. And then by the time of the 12th century Renaissance, by the time a couple of hundred years later, Latin then is a foreign language, even for speakers of the Romance languages. Okay, so one of the, the underlying points about this argument is that there's no reason why the Romance languages, French, Spanish, couldn't be called modern Latin, or Latin itself couldn't be called ancient Romance. They're the same language. It's just changed a lot. And that for me was a very exciting and uh, liberating discovery. It's just one, one take and there's bibliography to follow. So some of you are perhaps looking to translate medieval Latin or to uh, get, in, get in, in contact with these kind of texts. So how do you do that? Well, that's the million dollar question. And the answer is both good news and bad news at the same time. Uh, the, the good news is that there's, hmm, here, here, let me read what I've written. The golden rule is to aim for proficiency in Latin, not medieval Latin. Master the rules as best you can, and then think on your feet to tackle exceptions and variations, which exist in any form of the language. Okay, so you're not going to get anywhere a foolproof guide to how to translate medieval Latin. So as I've been trying to convey to you, it's far too various to fit into a neat handbook. So what you guys need to do is what you, I, I presume and suppose some of you are already doing, which is trying to get good at Latin in general, which is classical Latin, which is the Latin that you learn from the grammar books and from your teachers and from the classical authors, that's good enough. And if you can get in any way proficient, Latin is very difficult, but if you can get in any way proficient with Latin, that's what you're doing. And then what you do is you just think on your feet. Okay, so, you know, you always, ex you expect a dative and you see ad plus the accusative. You don't panic. You can probably work that out on your own. Okay, you're very used to seeing a particular verb take a particular case. So you learn in school or in this summer school or in class that the verb to persuade in Latin, persuadere, it takes the data. And then, you know, o OMG, you find it and it doesn't take any case or it takes the accusative. You see what I mean? It's once you kind of have a, a grasp of the fundamentals, it's not such a leap to just, um, to just work it out. And none of us, I presume, are going to be translating medieval Latin in a vacuum. So there's lots of help available, which is my third point. So I could give you examples of variations. And I just have one book on the bibliography, which is a book called Medieval Latin. It's a very old book, but it's been revised and it's edited by someone called K.P. Harrington, the details to follow. Um, that has a big grammatical introduction to it, which is quite useful if you want an overview of how the language changes. Um, someone called Alison Elliott has done a very useful overview of a, a grammatical introduction to medieval Latin. And on one level, that's very useful as a, kind of, as a kind of overview. But as I've been saying, and as she herself alludes to, it's too varied, you know, the, the texts are too varied to fit with any rule book. So some examples of variation in medieval Latin, which you could expect to find and which she notes in her introduction to that book are, um, some of you may be aware of the rules about the subjunctive in Latin and when you use a subjunctive in Latin. And those rules are relaxed. Sometimes you don't get a subjunctive all the time where you'd expect one. You don't panic, you just think on your feet. Um, this accusative and infinitive construction that I've mentioned, it's a kind of a hallmark of classical Latin. Uh, sometimes you get a quad introducing a clause like that instead of an accusative and infinitive. Uh, the pronouns is and say become confused in certain texts, but not just medieval texts, sometimes very early Latin texts. So say is reflexive, strictly speaking, in classical Latin, um, whereas is is not. That distinction gets blurred uh, in later texts. 
word choices. Okay, so in classical Latin, the word for to eat is edere. But in medieval Latin, you have these words manducare and comedere, which are the ancestors of words like manger in French or comer in Spanish. Uh, grandis takes preference over magnus. There are all these fascinating choices that have been made over the years. So casa is the word for house in romance, not domus, et cetera, et cetera. And as I've been talking about different constructions. So on one level, to kind of be exposed to those things is useful, but really there's no rule as to when and why such variations appear. So my advice to you, as I said, is to not so much to worry about what medieval Latin is, but rather just work at your Latin grammar and um, go from there. The final point is no less important. It's that help is available, okay? So please don't struggle uh, away at medieval Latin uh, on your own. If you are doing it, um, you have uh, your resources uh, these two weeks, you have great teachers. Um, you also have online resources. One thing I wanna highlight for you is the Dictionary of Medieval Latin from British Sources, which I give you instructions to find that on the, on the sheet I'm about to, to give to you. What is that? It's a dictionary of, it's what it says, it's a dictionary of medieval Latin, but it has all the meanings you need. Okay, so to take a very obvious example, Episcopus. You're not gonna find Episcopus means bishop in a classical Latin dictionary, or you might, but in other examples you won't. Where you need to go for the right answer is a medieval dictionary. And it just so happens that this excellent medieval dictionary is available free to access online. Okay, so I would put that front and center as your go-to for uh, medieval meanings. Uh, pay attention to historical context, that's a no-brainer. Okay, so if you need to know something about what you're translating, um, if it's the life of a saint, for instance, if it's a hymn, if it's a secular text, um, and I've, I've given you and I will go through with you a list of resources uh, that I have on hand there. Okay, so that's how to translate medieval Latin in a single PowerPoint slide. And now I just have for you five very short examples of what medieval Latin looks like. So here, for instance, is the opening of St. Augustine's Confessions. As I've said, Augustine looks both ways. He, on the one hand, is steeped in Ciceronian rhetoric and can write like Cicero when he wants to. Uh, but on the other hand, he's from a completely different world than Cicero was from. He's from a Christian context. And also, he's a stylistic innovator. So here is the opening of his Confessions. Here is my attempt at a kind of basic translation. And just to bring home to you that we're in a very different world from the world of Cicero and Virgil. This word dominus, which in classical Latin means a master of any kind, that becomes this capital, capital L lore. Okay? There's a direct address to, to whom? To this master. So if you just try and undo, just try and kind of put, like go back and try to undo any kind of knowledge of Christianity that you have. It's a very strange text. It's a very innovative text. Look at the repetition. Look at the repetition of et, 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 et. That's one thing I want to uh, point out to you. This is what we call in grammatical terms, uh, it's called uh, coordination. Clauses, parts of a sentence joined with the words and or but or or. I walk and I love and I think and I run and I, that's called co coordinated syntax. That's different to something called subordinated syntax, which is sub clauses joined by subordinate um, words like since, when, or although. So do you see the difference in my sentences between I walk and I love and I think and I run versus although I went to the party, because you were there, I left early. Okay, so that difference sometimes maps the difference between classical and medieval Latin. So Cicero writes with very subordinated syntax. He's full of complex sentences with whens and senses and all those. Augustine here is getting by with using et a lot and he's repeating himself. Here's uh, James O'Donnell writing. He says, there have been various attempts to find precedence for this form of opening, 
but in the history of Latin literature, its originality and oddity are clear. Most Latin prose works begin with a dedicatory epistle or a formal proem. This work has neither. It begins abruptly with a speech directed to a silent God, but speech chosen from the words of that God himself. So one of the things that I didn't make clear on this slide is that Augustine, even in the first few lines, is quoting scripture in Latin, parts of the Psalms. So very unique uh, kind of text and something you might say is at the beginning of what we call medieval Latin. What are the chron chronological boundaries of medieval Latin? Hard to know. You guys might have thoughts on that yourself. Here is something similar but different. Here is a passage from uh, Jerome's revision of the Latin Gospels. It's from the Gospel of Luke, and it's the a little snippet from the Christmas story, so the birth of a child. And you can see that, and I use this word advisedly, it's relatively straightforward. It might be quite scary still, depending on your level of Latin, but you can see there's lots of ets, and you can kind of get where your main verbs are most of the time. Uh, this is of a similar era to piece of Augustine that I just showed you. Uh, and here is the King James English translation. Okay, and it came to pass that when they were there, her, and just note the translation, her days were accomplished, strange phrase, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him up in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes, right? That's a phrase that everybody knows. But how does that relate to this Latin word panum? You see? Does panum equal swaddling clothes or could you use the word scraps of cloth or rags or something like that? Uh, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. What's the history of that word diversorium? Diversorium. Inn is such a lovely cozy word in English. Uh, who knows the history of that Latin word? And they were in the same country, shepherds watching and keeping the night watches over their flock. And behold, an angel of the Lord, Angelus. There's another Greek word. Do you, do you remember what I was saying about the Bible being a translation text? So Angelos, messenger, becomes angel, which is a, a big deal in terms of translation. And Angelus Domini is a very complicated phrase on one level. Uh, and the brightness of God shone round about them, and they feared with a great fear. So do you see how that those final three words are a bit redundant? We know that, why didn't he just say, we were greatly afraid, they were greatly afraid? Why did he have to say, they were afraid with a great fear? I don't know the answer to that question. Is he translating directly from Greek? Is he trying to be super clear and simple? Is he doing it for some other reason? Okay, so I don't have all the answers here, but I hope I have some of the kind of right questions to ask, as it were. Note again that we're in very much, um, coordination, coordinated syntax, lots of ands. There's a couple of subordinate clauses in the first line. There's two of them, cum es et ibi, when they were there, and ut paret, that she gave birth. Um, but then it's pretty straightforward in terms of syntax, okay? Um, here is Jim Adams, who, again, I have on the handout for you. Christian Latin was heavily influenced by versions of the Latin Bible. And the Bible was a translation text, full of artificiality and translation ease. For example, in much late Latin, the infinitive of purpose with verbs of motion is confined to biblical texts or Latin texts inspired by the Bible. So the question for you, I suppose, is to what extent this one text, Jerome's Vulgate, has shaped what medieval Latin is? Again, I don't have any straightforward answers for you but I hope the question is interesting. Now for something completely different and very exciting <laughs> from my point of view. What is this? This is a line of Latin that was scratched on a wall underneath the city of Rome in the first half of the ninth century CE. So it's contemporary with the Book of Kells. It's contemporary with that scholarly movement based around the Carolingian court, which I spoke about a few minutes ago. And on the one level, you have those scholars trying to enforce good, good Latin writing uh, along the lines of ancient models. 
And here you have a priest, we presume it's a priest, uh, scratching something which is becoming Italian. Okay, it's a tiny glimpse of a language that is moving from Latin to Italian. You have non dicere, non dicere ille segreta a voce, which is in modern Italian, non recitare le segrete a voce, don't say the mysteries out loud. Etched by hand on the wall in the Roman catacombs, a warning evidently between priests to celebrate the mass according to the liturgical practice recently decreed in Rome of reciting in silence. So for me, that's such an exciting kind of fragment because it gives you a glimpse of that other stream I was talking about. So on this higher stream, we have the language of intellectual Latin, which is going to become what Latin is. But then you have this spoken language that is becoming uh, something else. Just to give you a kind of counterpoint. Here again is another counterpoint. What is this? This is a, well, it's, it's hard to, to, to say what it is. It's a poem or a song. It's a text that may well have been written by a woman. So for me, it's, it's inherently interesting because it's reminding us that although we're in a, a very male world often when we're talking about medieval Latin, there were, there were women who wrote uh, in Latin. This is the opening to an, an anonymous 10th century Latin lyric, first edited by Peter Dronka, and he found it in the side of a manuscript in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And it, it got the attention um, a few years ago of Van Bolin, the Irish poet who some of you may know and who passed away last year. She translated it because she had Latin from her school days. So here is just the first stanza of this um, strange text. Uh, it's a it's a love poem. So just in the same way that all Latin in the medieval period isn't necessarily man's Latin or male Latin, not necessarily religious either. Can you see how the PH, the Greek PH in Phoebus has been replaced by an Italian F? Uh, that's just one thing to point out to you. Point, see the way there's a kind of a, there's a kind of a, a rhyme at the end. All the lines end in the same way. There's a kind of a jingle to it. Phoebus was gone. Phoebus is the sun and his sister is the moon. Phoebus was gone, all gone, his journey over. His sister was riding high, nothing bridled her. Her light was falling, shining into woods and rivers. Wild animals opened their jaws wide, stirred to pray. But in the human world, all was sleep, pause, and relaxation. Um, if you want to read the rest of it, you can read it uh, very easily online in, again, info on the handout. And here is Boland speaking. Uh, Phoebus Abierat is a mystery. It was written in Latin at the end of the 10th century in Northern Italy. Uh, it describes in the voice of a woman a meeting with a spirit lover. By any standard, the poem is extraordinary. It is rapid, passionate, a quick arc of sounds and meaning done in a language which does not usually bend to speed. Its edges are burned by vision rather than explanation. Who wrote it and why? We will probably never know. So as often is the case, a poet is particularly good at explaining a poem. Uh, so that's Evan Boland on a, an anonymous 10th century Latin lyric. And then here is my final example of medieval Latin. What is this? It's the opening of the Topographica Hibernica by Gerald of Wales, who is also known as Geraldus Cambrensis, who is very famous or infamous in Irish history for writing his account of the Irish and Ireland in tandem with the Norman conquest in the 12th century, and for describing how Ireland is a place that is, uh, well, you might say he's facilitating the colonization of Ireland, right? Because he's saying that the Irish are uh, barbarians and the place is empty and in need of, need of some work. Again, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert in that context. I'm giving you the opening to this work because it is a great example of what I've described as classicizing style. So here is someone who is intensely well-educated and he's writing Latin it is very correct, very stylish, and not a million miles away from something that Cicero would have written. There is 
lots of subordination. Okay, so in the first, look at how complicated the first sentence is. You have the date of participle at the beginning, which is something you find a lot in Cicero. You have an indirect question. You see how sit is, an, is subjunctive because it's an indirect question. Uh, we have a relative clause, quam ducimus. Where's the main verb? You're still looking for it. Videtur. Okay, so all those knots and tricky parts that you associate with Livy or Cicero, they're here too, okay? Um, as I consider how short and uncertain is the life we lead, literally in his Latin, to me considering, you see that, the dative? How brief and changing is, sit, subjunctive, not indicative, he knows his rules, which we lead. It seems to me to have been excellent, the aim of those men who, with the course of their life not yet finished, there's an ablative absolute, not quite, okay, because it's not cut off from everything else, but you can see patefacta via, thought that it was worthwhile. There's a really tricky kind of expression, pret to be worth something, pretium operai, a real headache if you're a student of Latin. Uh, to consider it worthwhile to leave some memorial in the world to extend their fame, you get the idea, okay? Hopefully this is proving to you my point that it's not so much when some or what someone is writing, sorry, not so much when someone is writing as what they're writing. Okay, so here you have someone writing hundreds and hundreds of years after St. Augustine, but he's writing in a very classical way. So five examples for you there. Uh, Gerald of Wales, our medieval Latin lyric, our Roman graffito, our Latin Bible, and our St. Augustine, just hopefully giving you an example of the richness of uh, medieval Latin. Lots of things I could have brought in, I didn't. So papal bulls, um, bureaucratic letters across medieval Europe, hymns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, a huge, it's a huge field. So I'm gonna conclude now the kind of lecture part um, just by summing up and saying that medieval Latin is the name given to many different types of writing from many different periods and contexts. It is too diverse to reduce to a set of rules. Nevertheless, it is often, but not always, Christian in context and incorporates both innovative and conservative styles of writing. Good classical Latin grammar is the best place to start for translation, making use of all the available help. Okay, so bear with me now. I'm going to stop recording. All right, I'm going to...